From the Toronto Star, I'm Sabah Etazaz, and this matters. Today I want to talk about a country where one woman or girl is killed every two and a half days. What part of the world came to mind when you heard that? I'm talking about Canada. Canada has seen an increase in femicide from 2019 to 2020, according to the recent report by the Canadian Femicide Observatory. Femicide is the killing of a girl or a woman because of their gender. The report says that almost 100 girls and women were killed just in the first half of this year. Most were killed by men, an intimate partner, someone they knew. Indigenous women continue to be disproportionate victims. The pandemic did make it worse. But these terrible numbers have more or less been constant in Canada. Why is that? How is misogyny linked to all of this? And what do we need to do to help women at risk before the unspeakable happens? I'm joined by women's rights advocate, educator, and author, Julius Lalonde, to help explain. Hi, Julie. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me. So... It's been kind of hard, frankly, to hear these numbers and what's been in this report. I wanted to ask, what stood out for you? I think what stood out for me the most was the urban-rural divide. So more women were killed rurally than we had previously thought. So 38% of the women killed last year were living in a non-urban area. And yet rural residents in Canada only make up 16% of our population. So rural women have very unique challenges that we don't talk nearly enough about. Right. There's some interesting data here that talks about those who are most at risk of femicide, like you mentioned, women in rural areas. And these are some things that might be contrary to what many people think, that there might be more incidents maybe in urban areas. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the data that's surprising? I believe that there was a link between age and femicide as well. Absolutely. So, I mean, I've worked in the violence against women sector for close to 20 years. And so I have to count myself as guilty in this as everyone else in my sector. But we very much have this idea that victims of domestic violence and femicide are young women living in urban areas. That's just sort of the common narrative. And yet, as I said, you know, 38% of the women killed last year lived rurally. And the largest proportion of victims were women between the ages of 55 and 64. So these are, you know, middle-aged and older women. Again, not the picture that most people have in their head of who is experiencing intimate partner violence, especially intimate partner femicide. And again, I think that speaks to the way that the feminist movement works in Canada. It's largely urban, I would say largely even GTA-based. I mean, even myself, I live in Ottawa, which is still a major area. And I'm constantly, oh, I thought I assumed you lived in Toronto. Like there's a real assumption that the leadership of the feminist movement in this country is urban. And I think that's reflected in the fact that we don't spend enough time talking about what's going on in rural communities, especially when you consider last year, part of the reason why the numbers were so high for rural women was because of what happened in Bukhapik, Nova Scotia. And so that does need to be factored in as well. It actually skewed the numbers on stranger femicides versus previous years because of that particular attack in Nova Scotia. Right. But at the same time, this is painting a certain picture. What is this telling us about the Canada that we live in, how we view and treat women's issues, particularly when it comes to visibility of older women? Like you said, these are numbers that I also personally wasn't really thinking would be the most common in incidents of femicide. Well, as I'm actually a feminist gerontologist by training, so I have to say it's been a bone of contention of mine for a very long time in regards to how older women in Canada are just invisible. Canada leads the world in deaths by COVID from older women. We lead the world. We have the worst rates. I mean, that's appalling and it doesn't get nearly as much play as it should. And I think it's related to this, right? It's related to the fact that women are valued for being or looking young. Women lose value as they age. And if you are in a long-term relationship, there's still a lot of stereotypes to assume that it must be fine. It must be great. It must be safe. And so we don't think about intimate partner violence for women who've been in the same relationship for 30, 40 years, but we know what happens. We have a famous case right now, Helen Nasland, who was a farmer from Alberta who killed her husband after almost 30 years of domestic violence. And she's been sentenced to 18 years in prison for that murder. And again, that's a woman who would be invisible in most people's understanding of intimate partner violence, right? You've been with 
someone for 30 years, it must be okay. And I think that narrative has allowed us to really push older women to the margins of this conversation. Julie, the report also talks about Indigenous women continuing to be more at risk. Why are they constantly overrepresented when it comes to violent crime in Canada? Yeah, so Indigenous women and girls represented one in five victims of femicide last year, which again is appalling. I mean, Indigenous women have been talking about this since colonization began. The links between racism, colonization, misogyny, classism, all of these things intersecting. Again, many Indigenous women in Canada live in rural, isolated, remote communities, which again provides its own risk factors. And so we know that the reality of Indigenous women in this country is proof positive that we haven't been looking at this work from an intersectional lens. And we've just accepted that this is how it is. And year after year after year, we get statistics showing us that it is appalling and we need to do better. But again, I think the conversation we've had about residential schools just this past year alone has shown that Indigenous women can talk about these things until they're blue in the face, but it's up to Canadians to start paying attention. I want to talk about our role in this. How does the media need to cover these kinds of stories? How do you think the way these stories are told and whose stories are told impact the issue of violence against women? We are talking about visibility and the lens, right? Yeah, I really want to shout out folks like Farah Khan, who've done work with a group called Femifesto to create a media guide on how to report on sexual violence in particular. They use a hashtag called use the right words to call out media who use really minimizing language. And so the language and how the media talks about this is huge. I mean, one, we need to actually be talking about these stories. We need to give them the radio play that they deserve. But also the framing is so vital. I mean, If I see one more story of femicide that is fawning over the perpetrator's mental health, the perpetrator, you know, he was such a great guy. He was beloved in the community. I mean, these things impact the way in which people understand violence against women. It very much drives home this idea that these are isolated incidents that, you know, this man was pushed to do what he did, you know, that this is not something that we should be connecting the dots to anything else. And I think the media is the biggest educator on healthy relationships, on violence against women, on consent. The media is absolutely what's educating people on this. And so if a news story comes across and the headline is very flattering or empathetic towards the perpetrator, the images that are used of the perpetrator or him, you know, out on a boat, having a time, like all of these things really drive home the fact that like he was a good dude who just snapped. And what research tells us is that is not at all the case. What you're saying is reminding me of the shooting in Atlanta of Asian women. And I believe it was a cop who kind of framed it as the perpetrator was someone having a bad day. So it's the framing. Absolutely. We had a horrific mass shooting in Plymouth in the UK by someone who was a proud incel, someone who was very proudly misogynist. There was multiple stabbings that happened just a few days ago in Japan. Same thing. This man was purposely targeting women. And yet the headlines are... He was sad that he couldn't get a date. He was bitter against women. I mean, those things matter. They really do matter. And, you know, folks listening to this might think, I can read between the lines. I know what that means. But the average person doesn't have that level of analysis. They're not thinking about this stuff. They're just being inundated with news. And if you just follow the news, the story is good dudes snap. And there's nothing we can do about it. So let's just tell women not to you know, go on dates and tell them to take self-defense. Like it really just reinforces these really archaic notions that are not helpful. We'll be right back. Julie, how adequate do you think is our community or our law enforcement at preventing a murder before it happens? How much is the way the police sort of respond to incidents of domestic violence, for instance, or early warning signs that something bad can likely happen? How much does that play a role in these numbers? Well, the tricky thing for me is that we too often look to the legal system to prevent violence when it's not in their nature. They are, by definition, reactive. They respond to incidents. They respond to calls. So already, I mean, the premise is already flawed. But I think furthermore, things like stalking, for example, you know, one in 20 Canadians will be stalked in their lifetime. Stalking is one of the hugest red flags for homicide or femicide. We know it's a precursor to being killed. And we also know that it is very rarely taken seriously by police. I speak from personal experience as someone who was stalked by an ex-partner for over a decade. The police repeatedly did not take it seriously. And in fact, a 911 operator told me, you know, unless he shows up at your house with a gun, we're just building up a case study at this point. If you are killed, we'll know who to go after. Like it's truly they're waiting for something terrible to happen in order to act. And so you could be waving a thousand red flags and it's still not being taken seriously. And so that's why I 
really don't look to the legal system to solve this problem. It's why the bulk of my work is around bystander intervention and building communities of support. Because even if the police were doing their job, they only show up if someone calls them, which means something is already in progress. That's not prevention. That's not actually going to end violence against women, even with the best of intentions and the most sort of resourced, trauma-informed police forces in the world. Wow, I'm really sorry that you had to go through the experience. And it's astounding how common our experiences are. I've dealt with something similar, but in Pakistan. And it's surprising to me that it's prevalent everywhere, right? Yeah, yeah, unfortunately. And I talk a lot about my experience because I know that I speak for a lot of people who can't. You know, by definition, talking about stalking makes it worse. But I'm a very privileged, white, able-bodied, you know, I speak multiple languages, educated person, and I was not taken seriously by police. And I got handwritten letters signed by him. I mean, it was pretty open, closed case. And so that's why it's so important for me to talk about my experience, because if I didn't get justice from the legal system, then I truly have no idea who is. So what's a better way to protect women? Do you think this needs to start at the community level, at the society level? How do we do this? We need to invest in education. I mean, the fact that teaching consent in schools is still considered controversial in 2021 will forever hurt my brain. (laughs) We know that prevention starts with education, talking to young people about healthy relationships, talking to young men about entitlement, about what to do if someone breaks your heart, but what to do with your anger, how to manage your emotions, what are red flags for unhealthy relationships, all of these things that we need to instill in young people from a very, very early age. And then we need to invest in bystander education, really educating people on what do you do if you see something, if you suspect that your friend's in an abusive relationship, If you suspect that your friend is not taking a breakup particularly well, these are life-saving skills that I teach in the context of ending male violence against women. But I mean, they work for folks who are having a mental health crisis. They work for folks who are struggling with their gender identity. Like there's no downside to teaching people how to intervene if they think someone is in need of help. And it can be done. We have the skills. It's evidence-based. But it's incredibly difficult to get into schools. And frankly, it's incredibly difficult to get folks to sign up because I don't think we've really sold people on the power because I think there's still this persistent myth that it's up to the police to fix this problem. And so individual people need to be invested enough to say, yeah, I'm going to take two hours and I'm going to learn, you know, the five D's of intervention. So if I see something happen, I can step up because I think the average person wants to help. I really do believe the average Canadian is appalled by what's going on but they freeze in moments of crisis because they're afraid they're going to make it worse. They're afraid they're not the right person. And those are things we can address a heck of a lot easier than overhauling the legal system, frankly. And we've all seen the effects of this COVID-19 pandemic on the violence numbers as well, to the extent where the WHO started calling violence against women and girls the shadow pandemic. Do the forms of violence seem to be getting more extreme. From the report, it says one girl or woman is killed every two and a half days in Canada. Is that something we're gleaning from this report, that things are just getting more extreme? They are, unfortunately. We know that the femicide rates in Canada in 2020 were worse than the year prior. I am so grateful for the Femicide Observatory's work because we, as those of us on the ground, have suspected this for a long time, but we didn't have that concrete evidence to be able to make those policy recommendations. So I'm grateful to their work, but I mean, we should be shocked. We should be horrified by the levels of femicide, by the fact that rates of crime across Canada are largely going down. I mean, we're living in a pretty safe country, probably the safest it's been in my lifetime, except when it comes to men's violence against women. And we don't want to name it. We don't want to address it. We want to really, really focus on these individual incidents and not looking at how it's clearly systemic when we have such incredibly high rates of violence against women that are largely perpetuated by men. And I would say more so largely perpetuated by men who claim to love those women. We're talking about former partners, Fathers, brothers, sons, I mean, elderly women being killed by their sons in this country is happening far more than people want to talk about, but it needs to be talked about. When we look at these instances of extreme violence against women, almost always we can trace back its roots to misogyny, to societal attitudes. You mentioned it's systemic, and we see it online as well every day in the form of vitriol and toxic masculinity, and we see it in our everyday lives too. How is this unchanged attitude of misogyny and casual gendered violence harmful for our society, not just women, but for any of us? And I know this is a really broad question, but can we do anything to transform this culture? 
I believe that to be feminist, you have to inherently be hopeful because you are starting from the belief that the world can change. So I will never be pessimistic about this. I absolutely believe in my heart of hearts that these things can change, but we have to be real about it. Just like Indigenous folks have been asking us to do around residential schools, we need to sit in the uncomfortable reality that we are raising young men to hate, resent women and girls, to take rejection as a personal affront and to seek revenge for it. I think of a case here in Ottawa where I'm based, where a police officer was charged with following his wife, catching her, kissing another man, and then destroying that man's vehicle in front of her. And the level of vitriol I received on Twitter for naming that men's violence against women was astounding. And yet when I work with my Muslim colleagues who, you know, every white person wants to talk about honor killings, and yet that's an honor assault, right? This man feels like this woman ruined his reputation, right? And he came after her and he was a police officer and used that. And yet people, because he was white, because he was a police officer, because she was cheating. There was so much justification for what happened there. And I think that's a microcosm of the broader issue that we're seeing, which is Canadians writ large at a very high level will say, I absolutely condemn violence against women. And yet they can't come up with a single damn example where they actually condemn the violence against women. There's always a rationale when it comes to every incident. And I think that is the sort of Canadian politeness sheen that we like to put over things, which is we're very proud to say we have a feminist prime minister and this is a country that touts gender equality. And yet I literally can't get people to find a single example where they think this woman did not deserve what happened to her. That's a problem. It's time to be maybe less polite and have more uncomfortable conversations, right? Absolutely. And when I work with my colleagues, even my colleagues in the US, but you know, my colleagues in Europe and Australia, they're all shocked by the level of this sort of disconnect between Canadians who are just so proud of being feminist and so proud of these things. And yet we have such incredibly high rates of violence against women. And that disconnect is jarring for folks outside of Canada. But as a Canadian, I'm like, oh, no, I totally see it. We just don't say the quiet part out loud, but we support the quiet part. We support the status quo. We don't want to be uncomfortable. So we choose politeness over just sitting in those heavy feelings. And I know it's uncomfortable. I am a professional Debbie Downer. <laughs> I go into workplaces and schools and I talk about things people don't want to talk about. But the alternative is that we're okay with these numbers. We're okay with this level of femicide. And I'm not okay with that number. And I hope others aren't as well. But your actions got to match up with your values, folks. Absolutely. Julie, thank you so much for having this really important conversation with me. And I hope it's the start of many other conversations. Thanks so much for having me. I was speaking to Julia Slalon. She's a women's rights advocate and author of the book, Resilience is Futile. That's it for today. Thanks so much for listening. I'm your host, Sabai Tazas. The This Matters team is Adrian Chong, Brian Bradley, JP Fozo, Matt Hearn, Morgan Bucknick, Raju Mutter, and Sean Pattenton. Our music is by so-called Mike DeAngelis and Sean Pattenton. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com slash subscribing matters. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon.